from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. With last month's special election in the rearview mirror, Rhode Island officials' attention is now turning to next year's presidential race, the biggest test yet for the state's revised voting laws. Will Rhode Island be ready if turnout sets a new record? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Secretary of State Greg Amore. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is on assignment this morning. Later on the show, I'll be joined by Eli Sherman and Steph Machado for a look at some of the week's big headlines, including our recent reporting in New Hampshire about the upcoming primary there. But first, glad to be joined today by Secretary of State Greg Amore. Greg, thanks for coming back to the show. Happy to be here. So let's start off with what we talked about in the opening sure. package. First votes are going to be cast, it's hard to believe, next month in the 2024 election. And of course, Rhode Island's primary will come up in the spring. I assume right now we're going to have big turnout next November with the way everything's going and the way things have been. Um, how are you feeling about the state's preparedness? It was uh, good for our team to have the special election. Uh, we, we, we got to kind of run through a practice session, so to speak. Um, but we're feeling pretty good. Uh, we, we're concerned about some areas because, you know, the last presidential was, was unique mm -hmm. in so many ways. COVID. And, right. And, and so many Rhode Islanders voted by mail. Uh, so we really haven't seen a presidential with early voting and mail and then obviously uh, election day voting. Um, but, but our team feels confident. We prepare all the time. We have collaboration uh, with the board of canvassers uh, around the state, with the boards of canvassers around the state, with the board of elections, but also with the cybersecurity agency uh, as part of the national security apparatus, the National Guard, the state police, the fusion center. So we're doing this all the time. Um, and we feel good, but, but you know, it's, it's concerning because there will be large turnout. And again, we, we do not have a model for this because the last presidential looks so different. Well, how much are you, the people actually running the elections, affected by the noise around election security? And I, I, I don't want to, you know, dignify some of the crazy stuff people yeah. say about it, but there's even plenty of people of good faith who have had doubts sown about how the elections are administered. Is that just noise to all of you who are running the elections, or does it actually have an effect? No, it has an effect. We, we have, there's two levels of security, right? There's the cybersecurity element, and then there's the physical security element, and that falls under physical security. And sure, the headlines nationally have an impact here in Rhode Island. So when uh, someone who is a longtime elections worker, a poll, poll worker, uh, watches on the news that uh, uh, a, a mom and daughter who had been working elections for years are intimidated and threatened in Georgia, that has an impact here. Uh, and and that's, just, that's just the nature of our media society today. Everything comes from the top down. And, and so that does have an impact. And we've seen uh, poll workers, election workers uh, who have aged out, but we've also seen some that have said, I've had enough. I don't want to face that type of threat. And then to recruit new elections workers is difficult because, again, they're, they're looking at the national environment and saying, is this worth it? And it's an incredibly patriotic thing to do, uh, to work from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. on behalf of the democracy. Um, so we're recruiting in a number of ways, but, but that's, a, that's a big concern. It's a concern for the local boards all the time to make sure they have uh, the people ready to go, trained well, uh, so that we can run a smooth election. That's interesting, though. Something that's as kind of motherhood <clears throat> and apple pie as being a poll worker, handing out the ballots, checking everybody in, now feels, at least to some folks, risky, even maybe dangerous. Sure, sure. And, and you know, we, we have actually seen some of this here in Rhode Island. It's, it's, it's not as prevalent in Rhode Island, but we've seen some of it. And we know that some of our local uh, canvassing boards and people who work in the local boards of elections face uh, criticism and uh, I, would, I wouldn't say threats, but they, they face a constant barrage of questions. And, and some of the, that questioning is around their integrity. And, and you know, at some point you say, okay, I've had enough. So you were actually quoted in a national USA Today story this week about your office's new student civic liaison program, which is help getting students involved in things like voter registration drives. But you're also clearly hoping it create a pipeline of poll workers. Is that hap having an effect so far? Yeah, it is. And, and we have 83 students from 41 high schools around the state. Uh, and they meet with our team, our civics education team, once a month. And part of our push is to have them consider working at their local canvassing authority uh, for the elections. And, and many of them have already signed up. And, and we would ask your viewers to contact their local boards or our office or the Board of Elections if they have time. S sign up. What uh, are you signing well, let's tell, There might be someone who's interested listening. <clears throat> what are they actually signing up for? How, much, how many training sessions is it? How long a day is it? It, it would be one day of training at the Board of Elections. Uh, there would be uh, consistent emails coming. Uh, uh, to, to check in on the process. And then it's election day itself, which is an incredibly long day. 
Uh, you know, you, you're probably getting there at 6.30. You're probably not leaving until just before 9. Uh, you're not paid extremely well, uh, but, but you're contributing uh, to our democratic republic. And, and I, I think we can't stress that enough. Uh, this, these are our neighbors. Uh, these are our friends. These are our relatives. They are not ideologues. They are not uh, people who are politically aligned. They, they just want to do the job well. And they want to make sure that their neighbors have a, a good experience when they vote. Who do, you, who do you call or what website do you go to? Where do you go you if you're You can go interested? to your town hall, city hall website and, and click on canvassing and get them that way. You can go to sos.ri.gov, send us an email. Uh, you can go to our, uh, our office, the Elections Division, at, at uh, River Street in Providence. Uh, connect the, with the Board of Elections. All right, let's talk some more about the, the structure of the elections. You alluded to early voting, how much we've gone from no early voting in Rhode Island a couple cycles ago to now a, a long early voting period. And we've talked about this before. There are people suggesting that, that the length of early voting should be short, not eliminated, but that it, it goes too far into when people are still actively campaigning and, and that things are taking shape. Where are you on that right now? Do you think it should be shortened? I, I don't because I, I, I want to see what this election cycle looks like. I don't think we should make an adjustment adjustment to that 20 days until we see what the 2024 election will bring. You know, we, we assume uh, some things based on 2020, but, but the last thing we want to have is, is long lines uh, at polling locations to discourage people from voting. And one of the things that the 20 days has done is it's taken a lot of pressure off the local canvassing folks, the local election workers, because there's not that pressure of an incredibly long line waiting to vote or, or uh, going past the hour. Uh, and so I, I'd like to take a look at that. Look, I'm always open to adjustments to make the process better, but I think we should wait until after 2024 be before we look at those adjustments. Another question is, uh, who's going to be running the State Board of Elections in 2024? Because the current executive director has said he is stepping down at a, a date. We, I don't think that he's actually announced a specific date yet, but the board has not found a replacement yet. They're still going through that process. Are you concerned that they're going to have a change at the top of the BOE in such a big election year? It is a concern because we are approaching the, uh, the presidential preference primary. Uh, I, I think they're on the path. Uh, I think there's some institutional knowledge there uh, today uh, that can help uh, whoever it is that comes in uh, catch on quickly. But, yeah, th we, we need to get this done. This has to happen quickly so that this person is ready to go uh, for the next election cycle. Remind me, your office now has an ex-officio member on the Board of Elections? We, we don't have an ex-officio. Okay. We have a liaison. You asked uh, for it, right? We did ask for it. It turned into a liaison. So we are there, and we have a platform uh, to speak and take direct questions during the meetings from the members, uh, which has been excellent for, for both of us. Uh, it allows us an opportunity to understand what the board is working on, and we have some expertise in the area of elections, Rob Rock, Kathy Placencia, who can inform the members. Another how we vote issue is the uh, same day voter registration, which, if I remember right, ha is actually requires a constitutional change in Rhode Island. It does. Um, is that going to, you know, getting a constitutional question on that would be a big, a big push. Is that something you're going to be trying to do this year? We are. We are. It's a legislative priority for us. Uh, and it's difficult because the, it is a constitutional change and you're asking people to get rid of something. Right. They're, get, they're voting to get rid of the 30 day uh, window. Um, but but we want to talk about this more in in terms of what it means. Uh, someone comes into Rhode Island uh, within that 30 day window, the 25th day they go to register to vote and they can't. That, that, it seems unfair uh, that they need to be represented just as the people have been living there uh, for years and years. And I always think about the, the, uh, the new immigrant who becomes an American citizen. And I've had the, the great pleasure to witness some of those ceremonies as Secretary of State. You know, that person has become an American citizen. One of the great responsibilities of an American citizen is to vote. They may become an American citizen within the 10-day span before the election, and they're not able to vote. Uh, we, we, have the, we have the administrative capability to do this now, and we should do it just like the other 28 states. I believe uh, John Marion from Common Cause once uh, told us that Rhode Island has the earliest voter registration deadline in the country. Is we that do. We that's do. the case? Yeah. We do. Massachusetts is a 10 day. Uh, Whereas Rhode Island, it's a, it's, a month, it's a month or so. Yeah. 30 days. 30 days. So um, let's talk about the state archives. Um, sure. This was a big push by your predecessor, Nellie Gorbea. Um, she was not able to get Governor Raimondo on board. They had battles behind the scenes about whether to put bond money on there. You're trying again to get the idea here, and we're looking at some pictures of the, where the state archives are now, which is rented space. Um, you, like Gorbea, have a vision for a, a big, pretty museum, f f you know, records building, kind of like what Massachusetts has. What exactly do you want? So, so I was one of the legislators that was pushing for this as well during that uh, span of time. 
I think we have a great opportunity uh, to, to, to talk about our history as a history teacher, um, but, but we have a practical responsibility to create a, a state-owned archives, purpose-built, that can take care of these documents. And some of these treasures are, are really amazing, uh, and, and, and some of them are incredibly unique to Rhode Island. And right now we have about like six... We're talking about like our, our copy of the Declaration two, of Independence? Two, two copies, the Southwick and the Goddard copy. There are, there are less than 100 of those in the country. Um, there, are less than, there are less than, I think, 22 uh, of the original broad, uh, broadside copies, the Southwick copy. These are incredible things. 64 letters from George Washington, the Act of Renunciation, Rhode Island's Declaration of Independence, uh, Abraham Lincoln's call for troops. These are incredible things that people should be able to access and see. Right now, you can't. Uh, but, but to go back to my earlier point, uh, about 16% of these artifacts are stored in a way that is not consistent with best practices. And so we have an obligation to, to maintain these and make sure that we preserve them. And then we have an obligation to, to allow Rhode Islanders uh, to come visit them, see them. And we know that it won't only, only be Rhode Islanders. There will be many people from out of state and, and across the country. We have around 17,000 visitors to the State House. These are pre-pandemic numbers uh, each year. Many of those folks are from around the world. And, and we think this is just a natural uh, connection to our, to our history. And I also would love to have an opportunity to create an education center around this so we can share our history with our residents uh, and with our students. Well, all right. So they came to you and said, all right, Secretary, we'll build whatever you want, wherever you want. Where are you putting it and how much would it cost? So we think the, the Gorbet administration did an excellent job on the site study uh, and the, the prep on this project. And we agree with uh, what, what uh, Secretary Gorbea chose as the site, and that is right in front of the administration building today across the street on Smith Street from the State House, And then that, that creates that natural connection between the two buildings. Interesting. And Governor McKee, of course, uh, would be very helpful to you if he put this in his it budget would. plan it in would. January. Yes. He gave very positive sounding comments to Ed Fitzpatrick at the Globe the other day about this. Uh, do you have a commitment from the governor? We, we have a commitment from the governor that he is enthusiastic about the project. Uh, th this is going to take um, capital budget uh, funding. This is going to take federal grant funding. This is going to take philanthropy. Uh, and this is going to take a bond. Uh, the, the Rhode Island people will have to ask, be asked this question and answer this question. But, but we have to do this. This is one of those things, pay me, pay me now or pay me later. We are the only state in the nation that uh, leases a commercial space for our archives. And, and, and to, to have these treasures and not be able to display them is, is really sad. It's really sad. We also have 4,000 boxes of materials off-site. Uh, so we're, we're growing out of the space on, on Broad Street, and, and we need to do this for the preservation of our history. So we have less than a minute left. One thing I, I wanted to bring up that people probably aren't thinking about now, but Rhode Island is required every 10 years to vote on whether to have a constitutional convention. I believe that's next year is that vote. Are, are you for or against? Well, I have no choice because if the legislature does not bring that forward, our office has to bring that forward. Um, you know, I, I think there's pros and cons to constitutional conventions. I think the con that I'm, that I'm most concerned about is that outside money has a tendency to come in during an election cycle uh, that, that may not be uh, uh, in tune with the public. That they're not really sure what this is um, and can influence a vote that might not reflect what Rhode Islanders actually think, but only a small portion of Rhode Islanders. So that's one of my concerns. But look, I'm, I'm a champion of democracy and this is a form of direct democracy and so I you know I'm, I'm open-minded to it although there, there there's legitimate concern about outside influence and, and big money coming in from outside the state that may influence the I the haven't decisions. heard much talk about it yet are you no, hearing are, no, is anyone not, organizing I anything not no not okay either. so we'll I'm sure that'll bubble up yeah. next year all right that's all the time we have for this segment Secretary of State Greg Amore thanks for coming in thanks Tim. but coming up we are going to talk with Eli Sherman and Steph Machado a reporters roundtable and some of the big news of the week stick with us on Newsmakers Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is on assignment this morning. So I'm joined for a reporter's roundtable by two worthy stand-ins for Timothy, and that is Eli Sherman, Target 12 investigator, and our old pal, Steph Machado, who is now at the Boston Globe. And plenty to talk about with the two of you, but I actually want to start, I uh, keep talking elections, as we did in the first half. Um, earlier this week, I was up in New Hampshire with our photographer, Corey Welch, um, to participate in our national coverage of the debate. And uh, I was able to speak with some undecided voters in the Republican primary up there. Let's take a listen to some of the voices of those New Hampshire voters. Usually at this point, I know who I'm voting for. Um, I'm one who takes the time to do your research. I go to as many events as I can. You take in what they're going to say. And usually by now, I'm like, yep, this is who I'm voting for. And right now, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. We have some really great candidates out there. 
and it's a toss up. I'm, I'm just really hoping that I can make my decision. Well, we're in New Hampshire. It's very cold tonight. So energy is at the top of the list. Economy, um, people are really struggling to look toward Christmas for the Christmas dinner and the presents that go under the tree. Well, I keep an open mind and um, I wait until all the factors are in and, you know, everything's been said. The voices of some of those all-powerful New Hampshire voters who decide mm -hmm. for the rest of us uh, who's going to be on the presidential balloting. So, you know, Steph, I'll, I'll start with you on this topic. Um, certainly there are some Republicans who are not convinced yet that they should renominate Donald Trump, bring him back with all the baggage he has at this point. That's especially true in New Hampshire, actually. Trump's under 50 percent in the polls there. But when you look at he's still got a huge lead in places like New Hampshire and Iowa, he's got an even bigger lead nationally. It is hard to see with just weeks to go before the early states how one of the other Republicans overtakes him. Yeah, and I think my biggest takeaway from the debates is about Donald Trump because he hasn't participated in any of them. And I think it's hard to imagine one of those other, I think they're, they're basically fighting for second place. Um, it's hard to imagine one of them overtaking him, particularly, well, I mean, listen, in 2020 and 2016, we all, everyone was watching the primary debates. They talked about it at the water cooler the next morning, and you don't see as much of that this year because the front runner is not participating in those debates. And so while they are useful for those undecided voters who are trying to decide who to pick in the Republican primary, they're not necessarily moving the needle significantly in terms of who's in the lead. Eli, I wonder to what extent if, if Trump didn't have all the, the criminal problems he has right now, et cetera, if we, we, we wouldn't even really be talking about there being a possibility he wouldn't be nominated. It's like the way we, we try to talk about like we do it with Biden. Yeah, it, definitely. And I think that one thing to keep in mind is while everyone is, is quite a bit lower in the polls than Trump is right now, that Nikki Haley, who... South uh, Carolina former governor. She actually has been making gains and she's really positioning herself as the alternative. She's polling at about 20% in New Hampshire. So is, are they gonna get there? Can they ever surmount the, the lead that Trump has right now? It doesn't look like it with yeah. the numbers, but it's something to watch. It's, it's gonna be an interesting dynamic. All right, let's turn back closer to home. Both of you had interesting and uh, honestly kind of alarming stories in the education world in recent weeks. And I want to touch on both of them. Eli, I'll start with you on this one. A big new report out this week on enrollment trends in Rhode Island public uh, schools and some stark numbers in there. Yeah, it's uh, pretty alarming. The Rhode Island Public Expenditures Council, which is a think tank, they released a report yesterday, Thursday. Uh, it showed that 7,000 students have disappeared from the public school, traditional public schools over the past five years and 32 of the 36 districts saw enrollment drops during that time. So you're talking about a lot of schools where they may be a little top heavy in the high schools, but at the younger ages, we're seeing this thinning out and it's happening both in the coastal communities where there's demographic shifts, there are fewer um, st school age students in those communities. And then in the urban areas, there's a lot of kids that are leaving for other ec uh, educational opportunities, but I think one thing to keep in mind is that there is about this hundreds, if not thousands of, of, of students within that, those numbers where we really don't know where they're going. And in some instances, they may just be leaving the educational system These would be altogether. like uh, high school age students who can kind of disappear and never be brought back into the system? This is both high school dropouts, but also kids that are not accounted for across all grade levels. And, you know, part of the reason is there's some speculation that a lot of these students are going to private schools or Catholic schools, parochial schools, but the data that the, the state has is not very clear. So there's just this question mark over hundreds, if not thousands of students. And I remember, Steph, you doing a story in the last year or two where I, I remember turning you in the year. newsroom when you were still at Channel 12 and you were, I was like reading down your draft story. I said, what do you mean they don't know where these kids went? Yes, and they had lists of all the number of kids that went to Catholic schools, the number of kids that went to private schools, the number of kids that went to home schools, and then there were just these missing children. And I think there was a, a sense that maybe this was just a pandemic problem and that maybe enrollment would bounce back but now in the report that that Eli examined it doesn't seem like it has and enrollment's continuing to drop even further which has huge other effects um, one of them actually is is the cash situation the money you need mm -hmm. because there's a lot of fixed costs in these schools you had a story in the globe the other day 
um, that I learned quite a bit from. A, you know, they're relying in the Providence School District, which you pay a lot of attention to, on federal relief dollars for also plugging all sorts of gaps, lengthening the school day, things like that. I honestly had thought, I admit, that they could spend that through 2026, which is the timeline for a lot of other federal relief money. That's not the case here. It is not. They have to spend it by um, next September. So basically, this is the last school year of the American Rescue Plan Act funds in public schools in Providence. The reason I focused on Providence, aside from it being our largest school district, was they got far and away the most money far beyond any other district, and they have a lot of it left. They have plenty of money left. It was well over $100 million. $128 million, mm -hmm. that was on top of, they had also gotten previous pots of, from the CARES Act and all of that. Um, they have plenty of money left, that's not the problem. The problem is the deadline to spend it, and they have used it to hire 169 new um, staff members, which some of those people are central office, and so maybe it'll be easier to eliminate those jobs, and, and some of the jobs were intended to only last um, a temporary period of time, but some of the jobs include social workers, behavioral um, interventionists, reading specialists who are there to try and help students with the social emotional um, concerns coming out of the pandemic, social emotional concerns that are Stuff we hear keep, about constantly. Yeah, keeping them out of school. Yeah. This, this all contributes to chronic absenteeism. Um, and the you know reading specialists, math specialists, those are they're helping kids who had learning loss during the pandemic. So these are all obviously critical jobs, and they cannot be paid with this COVID money after September of 24. And, you know, quickly, but master the obvious here, there's no, like, large amount of money sitting around in the city coffers or at the state house necessarily to fill that much federal money. No, the city's in the <laughs> middle of a legal battle with the school district because they want to give them less money. So <laughs> that's not happening. There are some people advocating to say state legislators should allocate some money for social workers and things like that. So there could be, this could be worked out. And frankly, they could they could move money around within the school district to make sure that they can keep the social workers, but they have to make a decision. This is what I keep saying. I think we're heading for a very different feeling budget cycle in Rhode Island in 2024 as the, there's so much less, it's been, there's just been money everywhere. It's been like nothing else I've ever covered in my 15 years as a reporter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know, looking back at when all of this federal money started coming flooding into the state that there there were a lot of people warning, do not spend this on recurring costs. And what we see in a lot of the schools across the nation, this isn't a strictly Rhode Island thing, but there was just so much money that went to payroll. Here we are, you have to spend the money by September, you also can't spend it on labor after that point. What does that mean? It means you have to cut jobs or you have to find money somewhere else to keep up with these recurring cuts recurring costs like jobs. That's supposed to be a big topic, I think, in 2024. For Let's sure. talk uh, briefly about the marijuana industry in Rhode Island. Just uh, marked a one-year milestone. Steph, you kind of looked at the state of the industry for a story the other day. How's it going? Yeah, I mean, the, the it, it's going, and they, <laughs> but a lot of things have been delayed. And so in the first year, we only have 11 months of sales because they haven't come out with the November sales yet, but $63 million worth of recreational cannabis was sold in the first 11 months. It's probably going to hit $70 million when we get the final month of data. Is that what they expected? Uh, ish. Um, they were below, the projections last fiscal year, so the fiscal year that ended June 30th, they were they came in below projections, so I think they adjusted their expectations mm -hmm. for the current fiscal year. So we are now on track to hit what state budget, the lowered expectations. budget crunchers yeah. think that, that we're going to hit for the next fiscal year. But there were supposed to be these 24 new stores that were um, anticipated in the legalization law from May of 2022, and there was such a long delay in naming the Cannabis Control Commission members that that commission is still coming up with its rules and regulations, has really not... Um, we're not at the point where they're going to start doling out new licenses anytime soon, maybe not even in the next year. And so that's slowing down the expansion of the industry. Which affects all the rest of the people in the industry, right? the cultivators yep. and folks who wanted more places to sell. Yeah, exactly. Eli, and you, you keep an eye on the regula regulation of this as well as, frankly, the law enforcement aspect. And, uh, well, I don't want to, you know, overstate. We haven't seen any mayors go to jail and, like, across the border in Fall River. Um, certainly there have been things that have caught regulators' eye they've been a little worried about here. Yeah, definitely. And you, I think you see this when you are shifting an illegal industry to suddenly a regulated legal industry, that there are a lot of players or people who want to get involved at the at the ground level who may have been engaged in illegal matters before trying to get into the legal world now. And so it's just, it, it opens the door for all sorts of potential shenanigans. And you see that happening 
uh, you know, you look at Massachusetts and, and they're a few years ahead of us. Their Cannabis Control Commission up there is a mess. Yeah, they just like they took the head person off the board and yeah. And so, you, you know, the, what they're trying to do here is be very thoughtful about who and how they can move forward so that this industry can move along. But we've seen bumps. We saw, um, you know, last, I guess it was last year, maybe the year before, there was an issue with a, a, an illegal grow business that had some illegal partners with ties to the state house. Uh, more recently, there was, a, there was a cultivator that was found to, to just hundreds and hundreds of pounds of illegal substance that they had in their, in their shop. So there are bumps, but um, it's moving along. It does we'll bring see. to mind to me, this was the 90th anniversary this week of the repeal of prohibition of alcohol ah. and what happened in the 30s. It's like we're seeing that again. All right, very briefly, Steph, 30 seconds. You've been a Swifty as long as I've known you. She's <laughs> Time Magazine's Person of the Year. What is your case to viewers who maybe aren't sold yet on why she deserved this honor? I really urge everyone to read the Time Magazine article, even if you're not a fan. The way that she's disrupted the music industry, taking back control of her music, the economic boost that she gave to the cities during her tour this year, it's like her effect on the NFL, frankly, a lot of things that even if you're not a fan of the music, which you should be, um, I think will interest a lot of people. I think it was an excellent choice for person of the year. Eli loves when I talk about Taylor Swift. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you for filling the blank space left by Tim White this week, and we will see you next week on Newsmakers.